Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Mad Honey by S.J. Nordia. It's right here, this beautiful cover. This is the book we are launching this evening. My name is Jennifer Malik. I'm the editor of The Reading List, and we're hosting this launch tonight along with Penguin Random House South Africa and Umuzi. Um, <clears throat> SJ's uh, sort of non-pen name is Fani, so that's what I'll be calling him this evening. Um, joining Fani tonight for the discussion is Masande Nchanga. Masande is the winner of the inaugural Pen International New Voices Award and a Betty Trask Award. He has written three books, The Reactive, Triangulum, and Native Life in the Third Millennium, and has received a Fulbright Award, um, and I might be pronouncing these next awards incorrectly, a Civitella Ranieri Fellowship and a Bundanon Trust Award. His work has appeared in Chimaringa, the LA Review of Books, Quarterly Journal, MIT Technology Review, and N Plus One. SJ Nodea is the author of the previous books, The Alphabet of Birds and The Third Reel. He is the winner of several literary prizes, including the University of Johannesburg Prize, the Keknek Report Prize, and the Herzog Prize and his work is published in Afrikaans, Dutch, and English. His shorter work has appeared in Granta and in journals in the United States, the Netherlands, and Italy. He studied at the University of Cambridge and Columbia Law School. Having worked in New York and London for many years, he currently lives in Cape Town. Mad Honey, the book we are celebrating this evening, is Fani's second collection of short stories and takes you from South Africa to Iceland, rural Belgium, and the Alps. It disturbs, surprises, and enthralls. As the author Paige Nick wrote in a review, world-class, electric, fascinating. Tension so taut, I read the short stories in Mad Honey with my jaw clenched. Please leave your questions about the book or the discussion or about writing in general or um, any, any questions that you have. Wherever you're watching this video on Facebook or YouTube in the comment section, we'll have time to answer some of those during a Q&A towards the end of the launch. Without further ado, let me have, hand over to Masande to start the conversation. Thank you, Jen. Um, welcome, Bunny. Uh, thank you for writing a truly remarkable collection. Thanks, Mr. Um, yeah, like I, I read it in a single go and it's completely captivated uh, from beginning to end. Um, I was wondering if you, just to give the audience a sense of the book, if you could start off um, by reading an excerpt for us. Sure, let me do that. Um, I'll give a little bit of context. Um, this is uh, the last um, the last quarter of the book consists of a cycle of three short stories or a triptych. Uh, and um, this is um, the end of the first of those three stories. And um, to characters have gone missing in the Alps in a snowstorm and uh, the narrator, the, the third character uh, from whose point of view this is narrated is imagining where they might be at this point, they haven't been found. Surely there has to be a rescue cabin of some sort, one built with rough hewn logs. Perhaps it isn't much warmer in there than outside and yet he hopes there's a, there's a candle they can light, so they can hold their damaged palms above the little flame. And there will be an emergency kit, one with a Swiss cross on the front, and inside the kit, some bandages and plasters, painkillers too. And there should be emergency food rations as well. What exactly they would be, Thomas doesn't know. If he had to choose the supplies, he would leave a crate of peanut butter for the lost men long shelf life, maximum calories, they would now be digging, digging it out with their blackened fingertips, clumsily feeding each other. He can imagine Rolf scooping out a lump and coaxing open Andreas's chapped lips. And once the two have managed to swallow something, they will dream together. Their body now dropped below the danger point. They are wrapped in silver space blankets, their jackets unzipped, chests and bellies pressed together. At long last, they have found each other. Finally, they can stroke each other's bodies with their necrotic fingers, with clumsy tenderness, careful not to snap off brittle ears. The extremities now have to be preserved like glass. 
frozen cartilage shatters at the slightest touch. And what are they dreaming of, the Italian and the Austrian? Of meal, of a temple veiled in mountain fog, a rake combing the gravel of a Zen garden? No, of these things they know nothing. Their fixation on her involved only aspects of themselves that they wanted to project onto her. They never found out anything about her. Now that a cold fire has been ignited in their fingers and toes and will slowly burn them to death, they are finding that their desire was an empty capsule. And only when, at last, they start directing their fantasies at each other, do they discover that each of them has always been the object of the others. Now, thinks Thomas, only now are Andreas and Rolf starting to understand something about the loneliness of men. Thank you. Thank That's you. it. It's beautiful. Um, just as you were reading that, um, I thought, you know, one of the most rewarding uh, things about your writing is how it operates on the sentence level. Um, just it has a certain lyricism which sometimes um, kind of lapses into the surreal and it's very controlled as well, um, but not not sparse. And I was just wondering, you know, and, and in, in this collection as well, uh, what's, what's also uh, incredible about the story is that you maintain that, you know, that lyricism and the meter and the sentence level, but it's also quite a tightly structured story at the same time. Um, it's really quite riveting, that cycle actually. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that process, um, whether or not you feel a tension between writing on the sentence level and plotting your stories. Sure, yes. Um, I very much aspire to sparseness, I think, on the language level. Um, I never quite, quite get there, I think. Um, it's possibly somewhere in between. Um, and it's quite odd. I've increasingly been thinking, you know, initially um, I thought that my past career as a lawyer had very little to do with my writing or that the twain shall never meet. Um, but somehow I increasingly think that um, it has helped me over you know, a number of years to write to negotiate and write thousand page contracts. Um, you know, at the very least at the very least it helps one to to sort of organize material. Um, um, it certainly doesn't help one to find interesting metaphors and it just doesn't help one to devise a plot, but um, I think it does help one with accuracy of language. Um, yes, I mean it's difficult to know the uh, the plot the plotting seems to be something which which um, drives itself in a sense. Um, in, uh, and I find that quite easy in a sense in the short story across that sort of arc, you know, in the short form across that sort of length. Um, the plotting seems to um, be driven, you know, in part by, I tend to start with characters rather than plots. Um, so the characters and to some extent the, the spaces they find themselves in um, helps help to drive the plot. Um, I don't know whether there's a tension, you know, sometimes there's a one, one each speed, of course, for, 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 to create tension and to make the plot move forward. Um, so I would like to hope that every sentence assists to move the plot forward. Um, I try my hardest not to, you know, write beautiful sentences or sentences that, that resonate with me for the, simply for the sake of, of writing them. Um, so I think there's, there's hopefully not a major tension. Um, yeah. I think uh, my writing style, perhaps, if I, if I think of it myself, it's probably, um, a lot of it's probably not very lyrical. Often it's, it's, there might be large chunks of it that's, that's quite yeah. functional. Um, and hopefully somewhat spare, and then there may be then sort of short explosions of lyricism um, that hopefully don't um, impede the plot too much or, or interrupt the tension too much. Well, sure. Um, in fact, I, I think I've come to understand that that's actually the beauty of prose, right? 
uh, with poetry, it kind of um, it compels you to slow down and absorb the imagery. But the beauty in prose is that agility, the fact that a sentence is unadorned and functional, but perfectly functional. You know, it's, it's not always um, about it um, kind of being floral. And you said something about how it's easier to, um, to plot with um, short stories. And I just wanted to return that a little bit um, and ask about you and short stories. Um, we've met now like at a couple of festivals and I know that you don't um, like to follow precedents. You kind of enjoy doing your own thing. But I have to ask, um, a lot of writers often write um, short stories. They start out with sto stories either to get their name out there or as a way of developing their practice, working their way up to a novel. Um, but mm -hmm. you've published your first novel now and you've returned to short stories for your third book. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what inspired that choice and also um, what the form means to you and um, what it offers you as a writer, I guess. Um, sure. Um, well, I've, when you were talking about poetry and, and prose, uh, a little anecdote came to mind of, a, of a, 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 I won't name names because this, these are South Africans, but a poet who once asked a, a very well-known South African novelist why, why he doesn't write poetry. And he said, you know, he's, he's done with finger exercises. Thank you. He's moved on to prose. Um, so, um, and I think there's a slight suggestion, perhaps, <laughs> on your side that that sometimes people use um, short stories in a, in a similar sort of fashion. Um, and I very much want to resist that. You know, there's um, there's a long tradition, of course, of of the short form, but um, it's kind of fallen out of favor in the last three or perhaps four decades, um, particularly in, I think, the UK and South and, and, and South Africa. Um, readers seem to be less keen to read short stories. Um, publishers seem less keen to publish them. Um, it's, you know, it's not commercially um, the wisest thing for, apparently for them to do. Now, I find all of this quite, um, you know, a little bit depressing and quite surprising. Um, you know, personally, I am attracted to short stories. I've always been attracted to reading them, and and certainly I am to writing them. Temperamentally, I think for me, the um, over the the art of a short story is the ideal length for me to optimally sort of uh, disperse creative energy. It's it's a, it's a form, but particularly the long short story that that suits me very well. Um, so. Um, so this, so I want to really sort of protest against this this um, focus on on the novel. This the rather, rather, you know, um, <laughs> monomanic um, focus on the novel as a form. Um, I also think there's a, um, you know, there's quite a, a a wide range of shorter forms that are being neglected. Um, you know, I, th if I think I tried in this partic particular collection also to um, show some of the possibilities that I believe exist on that range. You know, there's a there's a, as I said a cycle of stories or a triptych at the at the end that's about a quarter of the book, and then there's another there's, there's also a short story that's or a piece that's about two pages long, um, somewhat experimental or lyrical piece that's uh, presents uh, that's presented as um, you know, supposedly a, a, a libretto for an opera, um, and it's probably possibly a little bit closer to poetry than it is to to, to prose. Um, but um, and interestingly, if I think of you know South Africa in particular and the the form of the novel versus the short story in South Africa, I think the um, the kind of society that we are, um, the kind of fragmented society where you know, for all the obvious historical reasons, and then where communities often seem to live in parallel. You know, there's there, there aren't really, there's no, there don't really seem to be such such a thing. Doesn't seem to be such a thing as social consensus values and um, 
um, there's a contestation of everything there. There isn't that sense of coherence that historically one would get in, you know, in European societies, for instance, um, less so as they become more multicultural. And I think that, um, in part, is one of the reasons why, you know, the idea currently, I think, of the novel, particularly the South African novel, that uh, becomes a kind of allegory, you know, the the the, the big ambitious allegory or the fantasy of the the great South African novel um, yeah. that is um, the kind of book that is written by that would be written if it were ever to be written would be written by someone who has access to all the the cultural and social dimensions of South Africa and I don't think that's possible just because of how this society works um, and I think it's increasingly becoming impossible elsewhere so so this is a slightly long-winded way of saying I think um, Quite possibly, the short story is also, given the fragmented nature of the society, is is sort of a, a better tools in many ways to access social truths and social realities here. You know, it's just that 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 moment of of um, that that flash of of insight or, or the uh, momentary uh, observations, um, that sort of thing, in a sense intuitively for me might those sorts of approaches might work better for for understanding the south africa of now uh, having said that i don't really write traditional modern short stories i think they're more like mini novels in the sense that um, someone like dh lawrence might have written them absolutely in fact um uh, sorry you you're gonna say something no no you go you go ahead Masande. I actually enjoyed the fact that uh, this collection didn't come with the subtitle stories, actually, um, because I also felt there, there is something different that you're doing with these pieces. Um, I love that you mentioned two librettos as well, because um, we were talking earlier about plotting, and I feel like that's one piece where, you know, that's kind of done away with, and we do concentrate on Yes, character. Uh, I will say it's still character and just language. And then, like I mentioned, with landscape with figures, again, something very um, that does absolutely feel like a novel. Um, by the time uh, you reach, you know, the third part uh, of the cycle, desert, um, it's really, you know, satisfying in the sense that you feel you've traveled, you know, over years with these characters and you followed this narrative. So definitely, I feel there's, there is something nimble, a little bit amorphous and more interesting than a traditional collection of stories. And I wanted to talk about that, actually, that um, even though these stories are all very distinct, um, they are all in some ways striking both in content and form, but also um, there's a certain cohesion I felt between the pieces as if they were in communication somehow, um, not overtly, whether it was through um, the dilemmas, you know, the characters were facing or some of um, the really impressionistic scenes, you know, or when the, the language is really surreal or um, even with the interactions with landscape. And I just wanted to ask, basically, you know, how did Mad Honey come together? Um, what was the writing process like? Mm. Oh. So, <clears throat> you know, to start again with one of my gripes about how short stories are viewed, it seems often these days uh, collections of short stories are things that are thrown together um, consisting of, you know, leftover pieces of prose that um, novelists have had no other use for over the last 10 years. <laughs> and often, often the, the publisher you know, <laughs> would like them to have another novel ready, but they don't. And then, then that's kind of a filler as it were. So I'm very much in favor of the short story uh, collection as a project, you know, as a very conscious, purposeful project. Yeah, um, so, yeah. um, and yes, and that, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying it came across really well in this book. Well, thank, thank you. I'm, I'm glad it did. And then, um, um, you know, and 
as you say, even if, if there aren't, say, characters that, that are returning or that sort of explicit connection between between the pieces, um, hopefully because it is approached as as a uh, you know as a project, um, there are there's on the deeper level. Hopefully there are some some links thematic and so on. Um, and of course, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that is very un overlooked as well in, in the short story collection and the putting together of it is the the subtle and the less subtle but also subtle ways in which stories can um, interact. You know, they can, stories may well know each or other or one may answer the other or echo the other. They may push away from each other. They may, um, you know, um, may um, uh, somehow engage with each other or, or you know characters may reappear but um and, and then there's the other aspect of how you um how you chronologically order stories in a collection of course um and it's it isn't of course the case that everyone will read it from page one to to the to the end as they would a novel um but one does have, but assuming that the most most people will do that, there are all kinds of different effects one can achieve by um, arranging them in, in a certain way. Um, you know, if you read a story with the the recent um, afterglow of a specific other story in the back of your mind, you may experience that story in quite a different sort of way. Um, so there is that freedom with for the collection of short stories of sh you know shuffling them around in the way that 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 you find optimal um and yes of course if you write a novel you can you can also move around scenes and organize and reorganize it but um and in fact there was um i recall there was in the 1960s or 70s there was a dutch novelist who um insist that insisted that the, the pages of his novels should not be read in any any specific order in fact he wanted to publish them in such a way that they could be shuffled freely but you know with with printing and binding working the way they do um that wasn't possible but uh, but generally of course a novel is is what it is so um so yes um to i don't know whether answer your question but as i i, I think the, the the point i'm making is that by there is a way of working with the energy um generated in between stories in the way they almost like tectonic plates rub up against each other um and then are in this state of perpetual motion or um you know instability as it were um and that can make uh that can have the result that the the, the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts but i think that has to be carefully and consciously done and not, as I say, be the result of throwing together leftovers from the last decade. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I was thinking a lot about that as I moved from one story to the other. Uh, this this idea of, you know, the, the previous story still lingering as you encounter the new one. So I, I'm really happy that you brought that up. Um, I remember the first time uh, we met in Johannesburg, um, you were you had published the alphabet of birds um and i was just wondering your first collection and how different was uh composing mad honey and were the things that you learned this time around um yes i do remember that time we met when uh, i think you had just published the, the reactive i think we yeah. it was they were very close together in fact the reactive yeah. and and the alphabet of birth in the same year um so i could ask you the same question as well but i guess i have to answer it first but <laughs> um you're on <laughs> number three as well um the um i think it was Certainly, as as perhaps you know yourself, um, the when one tries to when one is in the process of trying to write your 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 first work, um, I at least had no idea that it would be you know, whether or not it would be published. Um, I had just by that time sort of given up a legal career in in London and uh, uh, career in law in London and came back to South Africa and had decided that now I'm going to write. Um, it's something I'd always wanted to do, but 
I'd never before had the courage for. Um, and uh, you have no idea whether you are just sending things in, you know, writing into a void. Um, and I think that has something, there's, there is something that is different about that process. Um, whether I, you know, the, the other question is whether one has, um, so, I, so I guess now one has a better notion that you will be published. The question is whether one has a greater degree of, of confidence or certainty and um, I would say no. I think I think it's quite important, on the one hand, to preserve a kind of uncertainty. Um, uh, you know, I think as soon as one likes one owns one's own work too much or um, feels too sure about it, that's probably um, the be beginning of of a, of a um, degeneration of your of your writing. Um, so I think doubting the the ground you know upon which you move is very much part of the creative process, and I'm not sure that has changed um, in any sort of way. Um, it will return to short stories, I must say. I'm currently working on a novel again, and maybe it's a good idea to um, to go from one to the other. Um, and I um, I haven't read your read your third book, your um, na native life in the in the third millennium, but um, I understand that's genre-wise also quite a jump from um, yeah. your, your 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 novels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is, it is, and and we'll have time to talk about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just returning again to to Mad Honey. Um, so we have here an array of stories that are set in a lot of different parts in the world, and I have to say. It's done with extraordinary skill. Um, the way that you're able to render like these different settings um, in such a knowing and intricate way, but also an, a way that comes across as natural, um, comes across really richly in the text. And um, so we have settings like South Africa, we have the United States, we have France. And in addition to that, we also have um, characters who are, you know, either these academics or professionals who are part of um, a kind of jet set. And um, so they have this remarkable global mobility as well. Uh, for example, in the story Hot Compost, um, we read about a young couple whose relationship unravels, begins and unravels. Uh, between London, rural Belgium, and Johannesburg. And I know um, that, you, you know, from your background that you spent your childhood in South Africa, but much of your adulthood um, abroad. Um, but besides that, though, I just wanted to know, you know, what does this global mobility um, offer you, you know, as a writer? And um, how important is it in your work? in terms of what it allows you to explore? I think notions of global mobility shouldn't be important in, you know, or shouldn't really correspond to um, anyone's notion of what is possible in their writing. Um, you know, some of the, the greatest writing, you know, the greatest world writing is, is often set in some remote or marginal place, or at least in one place, or some provincial sphere. So uh, so I, I would certainly push against the notion that the ability to write about, you know, world cities, cities which might appear on the bottle of perfume, you know, so the sort of the London, Paris, New York sort of um, approach. Um, that certainly in itself doesn't you know, guarantee anything for the prose. And, and quite often, in fact, having lived in the UK for a long time, quite often the most um, parochial prose is, is set in uh, world cities. <laughs> and, and often pretty parochial lives are lived in world cities. Um, so um, to start there, um, but the, the reality is that, uh, yes, I did spend a large part of my, uh, the, the majority, in fact, of my adult life outside South Africa. Um, and um, which is a gain, um, but it's also a loss. So the gain is, I guess, that, um, 
you know, the certainly the the spaces I write about, the places I write about, the settings I write about in this book are places I've either lived in or that I know quite well. Um, I certainly don't set out to, um, you know, create a cosmopolitan suite of stories or imagine that I'm writing world literature simply because of these settings. Um, and in fact, it's also, as I say, a loss in some ways because there's also a niggling fear or niggling um, suspicion that I don't actually know any one sort of space well enough to dwell on it too long in my writing. Um, to, um, you know, I've never set an entire novel in one country, for instance. Even my novel was set in, in, in between London and Berlin and South Africa. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an advantage. Um, I, mean, I can certainly, and due perhaps to personal, you know, complicated personal um, um, uh, experiences, uh, notions of being caught up in South Africa, you know, the 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 the, the white South Africa of the 70s and 80s as a, as a queer child, you know, in or queer young person in Pretoria. Um, and who didn't feel um, at home in any sort of sense in the world I was growing up in, um, and uh, you know, I was plotting my escape for a for a long time, and managed to to achieve it. But then, you know, the escape, of course, is also a a double-edged sword. You know, so one also ends up potentially in, in a sort of an, a nowhere of an in-between world. So, um, but then you have to make that in between world somehow uh, you have to sort of um, allow that to create a certain kind of energy or to become productive um, on a creative level. And I think that's probably what's happened in, in my writing. Um, and hence, I also gain a sort of creative energy um, when the work moves from one space to the other. Um, the characters, I think, often escape from one country or one city or one geographical place to another and and so perhaps to I as 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 the writer and it somehow gives a new impetus to, to the writing when that happens yeah absolutely and um and it comes across and i think it animates the writing in such a sense that even as these characters are moving around you have the sense that um you never lose sense of the characters in the story and it's almost as if um they're the center of gravity and these settings are almost revolving around them, which I thought was done really beautifully in the last um, story with Thomas, um, your character in the sense, and he comes almost um, not to ruin the story, but uh, in his pursuit of holy places and how those spaces were still very much, um, he was impervious to them. Uh, he 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 doesn't hard have the access um, that he imagined. You know the people who established themselves in these places would have, and he comes to terms with this. You know that, and in my mind, again, like he's the center of gravity. These places are out of touch. He goes in and out of them. They revolve around him until mm -hmm. you know um, he gets to the Namib Desert, and then um, he returns in a way home and um, the landscape, you know, almost um, it stops being a setting. It becomes a character itself and it's alive and is interacting with it. And it's surreal and extraordinary. And um, so, but, yeah. But he also has to keep it strange, of course. Um, yeah. He um, he has to take his Japanese friend, at least, to go with yeah. him, you know. <laughs> um, it, it, has to, it has to be disrupted, of course. It can't, it can't just be. <laughs> Straightforward home. No, no, no. Not There's no notion. Yes, no simple, of, no, no simple notion of home left. No, exactly. Um, which also brings me to something else I wanted to talk about, um, uh, which is landscape. You know, um, they are so richly rendered in the book, and that goes for whether or not they natural landscapes or man-made landscapes, like um, the Manhattan of you know, high-powered New York law firms um, or a view of Table Mountain from Newlands, you know, and again, the Namib Desert. And um, it's just something that I felt was running through 
of the stories. And I just was wondering um, if you could give me and the audience a sense of what your relationship with landscape is um, with your writing and what, what sort of things are you exploring with that? Hmm. Um, you know, and also one often has to sort of look back, uh, exposed to sort of understand what sort of landscapes one chooses to describe. And I think, um, if I think of my previous novel, um, those were very much urban, exclusively urban landscapes, of my novel rather, that those were pretty much exclusively urban landscapes. I think this book has more natural landscapes and it, it sort of dares to engage with South African or Southern African landscapes. Um, I always feel there's a complicating factor um, whenever one, certainly as a, as a white writer of my generation, um, engages with Southern Afri South African or Southern African landscapes. Um, there's always the complexity of, you know, what it means when one sees beauty in this landscape, um, a place which is which is inhabited by such historical brutality, um, and there's a history of, of course, of the the colonial eye, the colonial gaze, and you know, seeing the landscape but not seeing the people who are there, um, almost wanting to empty it out in order to make the landscape, you know, pristine and beautiful. So I think it's always necessarily problematic for me um, to describe South African landscapes. Um, and they certainly never not, never just beautiful. Um, um, Yes, um, the, it, it maybe the Namibian landscape, um, which probably is, you know, which probably is uh, large parts of it probably are, are truly an empty landscape, whereas in South Africa, of course, um, the, the sort of the colonial gaze has often presented the land, sort of thought of the landscape or imagined it to be empty, whereas, of course, it wasn't empty at all. Um, so, um, so perhaps that's why I felt a little bit more comfortable with the Namibian desert than than I, you know, than I would um, describing the Stellenbosch Mountains. <laughs> Definitely, um, I actually I was thinking about that as I was reading that part, um, and yeah, absolutely, it's it's complex, and you know, when I read the stories, also I feel um, that the characters, like this conflict, is is part of something that is actually in the writing. Um, there are often cases where the characters somewhat feel removed uh, from their environments. So it is a struggle to find a sense of belonging in the settings. There's a struggle to find uh, a means of fitting in um, you know, with the landscape. And there's also a struggle, uh, importantly, in finding a sense of belonging um, with, with one another. And and I wanted to say a little bit about the relationships um, in, in, in the book. There's this great uh, passage, actually. It's very short um, that you had. Um, it's in page 160, and it's from um, it's the story Miracle. And the narration um, goes as follows. The nature of their respective needs to escape these things was so different. The structure of their yearnings so irreconcilable and so unknown to each other. And I just thought that was such a great way of encapsulating what a lot of these characters struggle with in their complex, complicated, and often ambivalent um, relationships, very adult relationships as well. And I just was wondering, you know, what keeps you going back to that um, besides being good at it? <laughs> well, um, I don't know, uh, to, to be honest. Um, I don't know why the characters in this collection particularly, perhaps to a greater degree than, than in, in my previous two books, um, seem to, you know, sort of asymptotically 
approach each other but never you know manage to get together in a sense um, even if they are together um, there's this sort of um, impossible distance to the surface um, often in these relationships um, and sometimes when they see close seem close such as perhaps in the first story um, uh, with which is a, a story about a, a couple a Cape Town couple a same-sex couple two men who have a child through surrogacy and they might seem close originally but then ultimately through um, you know uh, through what happens in the story they um, something something is triggered and something goes wrong um, it's some way something quite deep below the surface quite possibly um, it's difficult to 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 verbalize it or to see it exactly for the characters um, and you know it's a short answer is is, is I don't really know um, perhaps just because that makes for uh, more dramatic potential than you know very uh, <laughs> Uh, it's perhaps not a slightly cheap answer, but perhaps it makes for more dramatic potential than a, a clearly functional, happy relationship. Okay, okay. Um, interestingly, uh, on that note, actually, um, there, are, there are places where I feel um, you could actually have taken an easier, more dramatic and more predictable route in some choices for drama where you actually restrain. And I was thinking particularly of uh, in stories like um, Miracle and in um, the second part of the cycle in Valley, um, where you're also writing about extreme opulence um, and power in some ways. And I found it interesting that your approach to these subjects wasn't immediately to be satirical of the, of the gate. And instead of the gate, and instead, um, by by the, by paying close attention to your subjects, the writing kind of reveals what's either beautiful or grotesque, like almost naturally. And particularly for Miracle, um, how you render Marcus, um, his ambitions to make partner in this law firm, and his habitat, you know, of of Manhattan, and um, it kind of vaguely put me in the mind of American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis, whereas, you know, Patrick Bateman is not a human being. Um, <laughs> and that's not what you do at all, you know, um, even though you, you're leading us somewhere, you know, uh, pretty <laughs> interesting and dark, um, but it's, it's you know, you, you humanize your characters and you allow uh, the material you know, to reveal what it is. And I was just wondering how important is how important is it for you to have this almost not quite but almost um, impartial distance when you're writing about your subjects. Um, well, let me uh, go one short step, take one short step back, and and say yes. I think the the Marcus character. Um, aspires to be probably aspires to be you know the partner in the law firm that he works for in that story um and then i think unfortunately marcus is uh discovers that he is human but that the partner probably isn't quite um but um just to move on to your next to to, to the next part of your question um yes i guess distance I think one's notion of distance is often determined to, to quite a degree by the narrative point of view that, that, um, that one selects. Um, and I seem to be a little bit unadventurous on that front. Um, I see, seem to be constantly using the, the sort of what I guess might be termed the, the close third person um, point of view, which um, means that one follows, uh, of course, means that one follows, a, it's not a first person narration, but you follow the, the, the perspective of one character quite closely. It's as if they have a camera on their shoulder and you can really only see and hear uh, what, what they see and hear. Um, and um, I do do that again, you know, once again in, in this story. It, I think it also gives one the, the benefit of, I think if one has a first person narration, then the expectation is you might have a, an unreliable first person narrator as well. So they don't always reveal um, the total content of their mind. You don't always know all their thoughts. 
but I think it's easier to um, keep a distance from your character with the, the, the close third person narration in the sense that you may have access to their interior or a lot of access to their interior or in fact very little access to their, their interior um, even though you're quite close to them. So I find that quite a, a comfortable in comfortable in between position. There is, of course, the um, you know the the slightly old-fashioned 19th century British novel approach of the the so-called supposedly omniscient um, narrator, which has um, to a great degree fallen out of favour. Um, although, having said that, I uh, just just last night listened to the. Um, well, I just read um, Dem Gal gets the promise and listened to his listened to his um, launch last night, and of course he's he's adopted a very um, interesting sort of approach to um, uh, he's he's engaged in some formal wizardry around um, the narration the, the narrative point of view and in part used uh, something approaching an omniscient narrator. So it can be done in all kinds of interesting and clever ways, but I think. Um, these times for me call call for um, this uh, this rather disciplined sticking in a rather disciplined fashion with the the, the close first person nar narrative point of view or at least or, or the first person po possibly um, it's an acknowledgement that of one's modest um, subjective view of the world um, you know, one, one can't arrogantly imagine any longer to um, to know everything and to understand how every, everyone thinks um, and to be everywhere and uh, at the same time. Um, and then, I mean, to link it perhaps to, to a slightly different matter, which is um, something that I think fiction can do um, in this country in particular, um, you know, obviously we live in a, in a country with, with um, a long brutal history where, um, and one aspect of that brutality to my mind, the perhaps the most salient feature of current South African brutality is the way that South Africans from different communities tend to approach each other and um, almost preemptively um, Pre-impose an identity, you know, on 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 each other. Um, it's an approach often of, don't you tell me who you are? I know better than you do. And I think um, fiction, and particularly through um, subjective uh, narrative points of view, um, can be quite useful in playing a certain kind of not political role but perhaps more social cultural role in the sense that um, it can sort of subvert expectations in the sense that fiction can show you know how south africans really can be you know how south africans with certain presumed identities uh, who they can actually be and what they actually think and what their stories actually are and how far that might be from from expectations, um, and so I think characterization um, and the mode of characterization from that perspective is very important in in the South African novel. Um, and I'm actually and and this can provide a sort of a you know it's maybe an ambitious notion, but I think it can Im reading in South Africa can then provide these sort of sorts of nodes of potential nodes of renewal. Um, these, these, um, this possibility for um, the new, new kinds of communities to be created um, by, you know, through uh, a sort of subversion of, of expectations. I mean, I'm thinking of one particular interesting example, um, in fact, in, in your own work, in the reactive, um, one, to me, one very interesting aspect of your characterization was that the way you um, eschewed um, clear cultural markers for, for your characters. It would often be quite tricky, um, you know, in South Africans, even readers, even sophisticated readers often want instantly to um, understand what the cultural positionality is of a character, you know, or racial, be it racial or cultural. 
And um, one of the very interesting, extremely interesting things to me in your novel um, was that it's um, very much in your first novel was it very much avoided that, um, and it created an interesting sort of dislocation. But in any event, so that's a very long-winded answer to your question. I think I've strayed from your question, but um, uh, that that's my kind of very optimistic notion of what fiction could do in South Africa if if only more people would read. I um, I like that actually, and I and I think you do uh, challenge yourself in in those ways. Um, thinking specifically of the two short stories, the the two stories that are primarily set uh, in South Africa, one in Cape Town, and one in Joburg, um, Fauzi Al Junaidi and To the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And um, in the first story, we have you know uh, a gay white couple. Uh, living in Cape Town, who, um, after much difficulty, managed um, to have a son. And they live an ostensibly tranquil uh, domestic life thereafter until um, they help her relate a hate crime um, that was um, perpetrated against their son uh, in um, a township. And in the second story that's set in Joburg, we have um, a white divorced single mom um, moving into uh, a community that uh, that's marked by what the narration um, at one point de describes as Johannesburg paranoia, which is obviously classed and uh, racialized as well. And um, before I ask you about both these stories, it's quite interesting the thing about the markers because and I don't want to give this away for readers, but you, what you did um, with that child on the platform and how it's, um, you know, you only yield the information later after, you know, the reader has already made the assumptions. Um, because at some point she's on the platform, Laura, the, the character, and um, she's kind of envisioning how she would defend herself where she, where she, where she to be attacked by a teenage boy who's obviously like very scrawny and she's kind of imagining snapping his limbs and you know it's 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 quite it's a uh, it's quite unflinching um and then later of course you you reveal this information and but also you reveal it in such a way that it's animated because it becomes this 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 question you know that she asks herself morally you know would she had treated this person differently had they not looked a certain way, et cetera. And um, I found these stories uh, in which both you um, and I, I guess, the South Africans are implicated in because um, they directly address these parallel worlds that um, we inhabit and um, they deal, yeah, like I said earlier, very unflinchingly with questions of complicity um, with shame and, you know, what one's role is um, in a devastatingly unequal society. And um, I just, I wanted to ask you, you know, how was the process of um, writing uh, those words? What particular challenges um, uh, did you, did you face and what did you eventually learn? Because unlike, um, the landscape which you could assume and do the Namib desert here you know you went right for it <laughs> sure you know i think they they are um those two, those two stories perhaps you know in small ways represent uh <laughs> small beginnings of attempts to to um think about those those very those those massive issues and i think i think in truth um South African South Africans have only really started to um, well I mean some people of course don't think about it at all quite a lot of people don't want to think about those those matters but I think we only started to think in in modest ways um, in not very ambitious ways uh, and perhaps not with enough imagination about those issues uh, those matters um, and there are certain things I think you know, and while I'm saying this, I'm wondering whether it's also because it's so difficult to 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 think with with enough imagination about these issues. 
um, whether it's easier sometimes to set one's stories outside South Africa. Because as soon as you write a story that that is set in Johannesburg, there's no way that you can avoid the weight of of history and and grapple with with issues of complicity, issues of inequality, issues of of, of race. Um, and um, so, and, and I think, to my mind, fiction is a very good um, medium for, um, and prose in particular, is a very good medium for trying to do this this thinking. Um, but I think there's an enormous amount of thinking to be done through 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 prose. Um, and this, these are very modest attempts to start thinking about those matters of complicity. And one does, of course, one does discover things in that uh, in that process. Um, one, um, I mean, it's difficult to verbalize what it is that one discovers. But um, if the thinking leaves one without discovering things about yourself and without um discovering one's own complicity at least um beginning to discover um one's own complicity then you probably haven't done enough thinking through the prose so it's it's interesting as an act of understand you know writing prose as an act of understanding or as an act of trying to begin to understand um is is an interest is very interesting interesting to me um yeah i really like the idea of that that um for prose to really function well it starts to set certain demands um place certain demands on the writer and um and you know it kind of compels you in a way to learn more and to change it and as you said you know uh, to be challenged by the writing and to get something on the other side of the writing or else um, it ends up not really, you know, working. And uh, I've also found that it, when, when I write across my own um, positionality as well, um, it, it is something that I've uh, ended up learning quite a lot from. And um, it's, I think there's a lot to be said about being willing to take that risk. Um, sure. Yeah, I think being willing to take I think it's. Yes, I think it is a risk, and of course, um, and as you say, it has to be from a position of of uncertainty. And um, if one knows how the story is going to end when you start writing it, then um, then it's probably the wrong story, you know. Um, and if you, um, unless you're willing to um, be changed by the writing, then um, it's probably the wrong story as well. And of course, at the same time, um, I, I, I'm often, um, the more I write, the more interested I am in how fundamentally nonverbal somehow the, the process of, of writing is, um, you know, and this, this little crust of, of words that, that form the surface that represents the, the unconscious has, um, you know, thrown at you as dredged up. Um, is really um, quite an inadequate sort of tool. And in fact, one is trying to reach through those words, of course. So on the one hand, it's a, as, as we say, it's a process, I think, of trying to, to um, think through something in the prose, but it's also a process of trying to reach people on the other side, you know, the readers on the other side of that thin, thin membrane of words and to create certain effects, of course, to change change something there as well to at least wedge something into the unconscious of of your reader that may hopefully um, linger there for a while um, and it's probably too easy to say you want to change pers perspectives um, or you want to um, I think what yes it's it's more as sort of a, some sort of discomfort that um, you want your readers to experience a kind of um, emotion that they find hard to name or strange hybrid of emotions and then you want to wedge something in, into this the unconscious that would um, that may change that person as well but that's a very ambitious and perhaps a um, slightly power hungry sort of ambition <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't exactly say power hungry um, i think <laughs> 
with anything, it's just uh, I, it, it feels part of this ongoing project that we have as South Africans and also as um, writers and artists, which is to um, communicate with each other, essentially, you know, uh, to sure. reach across those those, those parallels. And, um, and I found that, you know, uh, in my experience of reading Mad Honey, um, definitely uh, had that effect on me. And um, yeah, things were wedged into my consciousness and um, it left me with a lot to think about and also um, revitalized as well, um, certain things that I was starting to take for granted. And um, I think we could go on <laughs> and on, but I think um, I'm gonna invite Jennifer to come back now because I think we have actually run out of time. Yeah, we have. I mean, as I was saying, like these um, online launches, the time goes by quicker than you think. But I think that was especially the case tonight with this um, wonderful writerly discussion. So thank you very much, Fani and um, Masande, because um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. I think in some ways you have quite similar writing sensibilities, which made for a very interesting discussion for those of us who only read. <laughs> and um, I must say, power hungry. Power hungry literary fiction is something I could get behind, definitely. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one can one can but fantasize. <laughs> <laughs> the world would be a better place. <laughs> so thank you very much to Penguin Random House for helping us put this launch together. Um, if you haven't got a copy of Mad Honey yet, which looks like this, so you can spot it on the bookshelves very easily. It's got a very eye-catching and lovely well-designed cover um, then if you haven't got just if you haven't got a copy yet then I'm sure this discussion has made you want to run out and get one first thing tomorrow morning or you could even buy one online tonight if you're that way inclined um, and uh, thank you thanks again to my Sunday and, and Fani for that uh, that chat it was really enjoyable thanks very much Jennifer and thanks thank for you. Sunday thank you thank you Fani thanks Jennifer. have a great evening <laughs>